Our last study was the things we believe. And we're just going to segue in now to the things that we experience. We went through the Gospels and we went through the first half of the book of Acts, give or take. And what we found out was that the Holy Spirit is prominent from the beginning of the New Testament all the way through. And he's not just generally or in name prominent, but he's particularly prominent in the life of believers as the promise of the Father. We saw that that promise was incredibly important to the Old Testament saints and that when it came to the New Testament and the the revelation of Jesus Christ, he made sure that we understood that the promise was the focus, the promise. And then we said at the end of uh, our last study that that's kind of how the pivot point in the middle of Acts there in chapter 11 is that when they heard that the Gentiles had received the promise, you know, when the Samaritans got it, they were like, no, man. But when they heard the Gentiles got it, I I can just imagine them being livid until Peter said, because we heard the same thing that we experienced in the beginning. And the Bible says when they heard that, they praised God. And I told you last week that to me then that just says the rest of the New Testament is about how how this happens. So that's what we're going to look at. I found a great book a while back that was already on my shelf, but I had not really dug into it. It's from 2009, written by an Assemblies God pastor, and it's called When the Spirit Speaks, Making Sense of Tongues, Interpretation, and Prophecy. So we're going to talk about this book. I've got 20 of them on order for you if you're interested. It's very short, you can see. But it may not be the kind of read that you would enjoy. It might be. But it's really about those three public gifts of the Holy Spirit. So we're going to ease our way into this. And these three are known not just to he and I, but to all kinds of people in Spirit-filled churches. These three of the nine gifts... From 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the nine gifts, these three are known as the vocal gifts. Makes sense, doesn't it? Because they all are speaking gifts, right? It's not faith, it's not miracles, not healing. These are the vocal gifts. And these vocal gifts are often for us as believers a challenge as to how they function and what their purpose is. So we're just going to go through this, and uh, most of what we're going to do in the next three weeks is based on his book. I gave him lots of credit there because I want you to see that. I don't quote him very much. If I do, you'll see that noted as well. But everything is um, from him and 1 Corinthians, along with a couple other places, okay? So that's what we're going to talk about. And I want to I want you to begin to feel comfortable in being not only a spirit-filled church, but knowing how things are being governed. Sunday night we have a business meeting, and, and a lot of people will be thinking, well, this is how we govern the church. This is how we administrate the business of the church. But how we govern takes place on Sundays in the services, and to a lesser extent Wednesday night, and in youth and in Royal Rangers and in Bible study and and cleansing stream. Because what we're talking about is the work of the Holy Spirit, right? How he moves among us. Now, what we're going to look at is there's kind of two aspects to this. There's the private and the public. And we'll see that that's pretty clearly spelled out in the Corinthians. Paul really helps us to understand that distinction. You can see it in the book of Acts, But the theology of it, the understanding, the study of it comes in Corinthians. And I told you last week, it's really important to remember that after Peter has been in Samaria and the Samaritans have received because Philip was there and preached and they sent Peter and John up there quick as they could get there and they pray for him and as they lay their hands on they all are filled with the Holy Spirit. And so when they get back, Paul is in Jerusalem with the apostles. And so you have, that has to be a part of our understanding. From his earliest days, he sees the tearing down of the wall of separation. He, he wasn't traveling with Jesus. He wasn't even born again. But after that Damascus road, it says he goes to Jerusalem and is with the apostles and powerfully preaches 
Now, this is right before chapter 10 where Peter is at Cornelius' house. But there's no doubt that these stories of the Samaritans receiving are just stirring him and helping him to realize, oh boy, God is on the move. It's fine if God wants to save everybody on the whole planet. That's, that's his business. But he can't give that promise to the Gentiles. No, no, no. And you see those apostles kind of guarding that. But Paul, he doesn't guard it. Paul gets it. The wall is torn down. The baptism's for everybody. So that's what we're going to build on. When Paul sees that, uh, and I'm talking theologically, when he helps us to see it, he's already aware that the individual believer has a spiritual experience. The individual believer has the infilling. But there's also the corporate experience for the church. That's most of what we're going to talk about. All right? In this study, we're going to be talking mostly about that and how we can make sure that these gifts function within our congregation, but they are not off-putting to the unbeliever or even the believer. A couple of things that he says in here kind of checked me, and I'll share that with you as we go through it. Okay? I'm not sure if we'll get through all this tonight, but we're going to try to. And you, uh, When you have a question or a comment, Please um, just get my attention and we'll jump in, okay? Now that we've looked at what we believe about the Father's promise to us, the baptism in the Holy Spirit given by Jesus, we need to begin to dig deep into how the Spirit works in us. Pastor Bullock looks at the three vocal gifts in this book. And we'll use that to lightly examine the private experience in the Spirit and more deeply the public one. Early in this first chapter, Pastor Bullock sets forth a biblical principle that although not based on a specific verse in the Word, is certainly borne out. Did I, did I use that word? Is that B-O-R-N-E, borne out? E or no E? I looked it up and I still wasn't sure. I looked it up on the Internet. Anyways, it looked right earlier. I'm not sure if it looks right now. It's certainly borne out. You know what I'm saying though, right? In, the, in text after text, the Holy Spirit will never sponsor any vocal gift that will drive people away from Christ. That's a quote from him on page 15. The Holy Spirit will never sponsor any vocal gift that will drive people, not just unbelievers but believers too, away from Jesus Christ. He can't. That's contrary to his nature, the Holy Spirit. That's contrary. If he were to do things... So when we say, well, that's the Holy Spirit, or this is the Holy Spirit, when you say it, or we do it as a whole church, we are endorsing that which is happening. And if that which is happening is pushing people away from Jesus, it really is not the Holy Spirit. Amen? Because when the day of Pentecost happened in Acts chapter 2, you keep reading through that chapter, and at the end, what happens to 3,000 people? They all got saved. Uh Uh-huh. So you can see the connection there. Because Jesus said in John 14, 15, 16, when the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to testify about me. He's going to tell people about me because that's what the Holy Spirit does. He, He is just constantly pointing out Jesus, always making sure that Jesus is manifested, worshiped, exalted, and... um, that Jesus is the singular focus of worship. Okay, so we're going to use that as our guiding principle also. We find indirect reference to both the private and public expressions of the Holy Spirit's vocal gifts in 1 Corinthians 14. All right, so you can turn there in your Bible if you've got your Bible with you tonight or your, or your Bible app. How many of you use, you're, you're using the app to uh, read through the... I want to be careful I say this. How many of you are um, reading through the Old Testament with it, or through the Bible this year? How many of you are here tonight? Okay. So do you use, I don't read my Bible on my phone, but I do mark that I, I read it in the app. You know what I mean? There's a, you check. How many of you are doing that? You're checking on your app that you read? Okay. Yeah. And I think, Sister Pam, you read, your, you read the, the three chapters on your phone, though, don't you? Usually, yeah. Okay, right. Read, read. Yeah. Does anybody else do that? Your phone reads the text to you. Yeah. Okay. I'm just curious. Anyways, if you have your Bible, go to First Corinthians chapter 14. 
And I'm going to tell you, this little book is really good. Um, I'm not all the way through it yet, but um, it's, it's, you, there are no other books that I know of just on these three gifts. <laughs> That's a pretty narrow niche audience. I don't think it's a bestseller in any category. Like even on Amazon, you know, a category of uh, the three vocal gifts. I don't know that there is that category. But uh, 14, look at verse, what do I have listed there for you? 1, 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Let love be your highest goal, but you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. Now, those special abilities, New Living, we know King James, the uh, King James says what? Gifts? We are to desire these things. Amen? Yeah, that's a command. Yeah, let love be your highest goal. But you should also desire the special abilities. The denominations and churches that say, well, you know, we don't get into all those gifts because we're focused on the higher goal of love. Terrific. Praise God. That should be focus 1A. But 1B is supposed to be and the gifts. Right? Nobody's doing God a service by not having the gifts of the Holy Spirit operating in their church. And then also in verse 14, verses 14 and 15, um, look at what he says there. For if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. What then, what shall I, well then, what shall I do? In verse 15, I will pray in the spirit and I will also pray in words I understand. I will sing in the spirit. And I also will sing in words I understand. Again, he's talking about both, right? He's telling you and I to do this. Verse 1 is a command. These verses, it's a demonstration. Listen, gang, this is how I do it. Uh, I know that I was a heathen and a sinner and I persecuted the church, but man, when the Holy Spirit was poured out in my life, I got, I got busy in a hurry in the Spirit of God. And then um, verse 17, it's giving thanks. Okay? So we find both reference to both the private and public expressions of the Holy Spirit in this section, among others. But there is the distinction between the private and public in all of this. To distinguish, well, I guess that was a question, right? To distinguish, we must know exactly what the public vocal gifts are. And those... Well, we see it in the title of his book, Tongues, Interpretation of Tongues, and Prophecy. In our previous study, we learned that the apostles recognized what was happening to the Samaritans. But the Gentiles, that was a whole other thing, when they saw it, they recognized it because they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God, Acts 10.46. This, of course, represents the launching of each believer's private experience with the Holy Spirit. Okay, let's, let's camp there for a minute. That's the private experience. They, they didn't say, well, th this was happening and there was a message, there was an interpretation, there was a prophetic utterance. Acts chapter 2 says they were all praising God in languages that they had not learned nor been taught. That's, that's me adding to it. They, Acts 2 says, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Ghost gave them the utterance. That's the King James, right? And so those other tongues are, in my definition for you, languages. They're not sounds, syllables, and gibberish, but they are syllables and words. They are not uh, from over, being overzealous. They're not emotional. These are languages, but they're languages that you have not been taught nor learned. Okay, so that's the, uh, the King James there of um, um, other tongues. In other words, other to them. They didn't know them. Nobody gave them a crash course in, in Urdu and said, okay, now go out there and praise God in Urdu. That's important. So when we talk about this private experience, what we mean is individually, uniquely you. You get that experience with God. And then the phrasing that Paul uses, we, we kind of extrapolate from that and we call it your, we can call it, you may hear this term, your prayer language. 
It doesn't mean it, it never changes. It doesn't mean that you're always praying. It just simply means that it's private, that's yours, as opposed to a public utterance in tongues, a prophetic declaration in tongues with an interpretation. Does that make sense? You understand? So we're talking about two things here, and they work together. Two things, and they're complementary. Two things, one of which is available to every believer. One of which is expected to be every believer's experience and privilege. You get it. You don't have to say no. You don't have to say, well, I don't want it. You don't have to say, well, I'm not worthy of it. I don't deserve it. The Lord knows all that. Praise God. That's exactly right. But the privilege is, this is available. Well, I prayed and I asked God. I was touching on that Sunday too because I hear this all the time from people who are in various entanglements with sin. Well, I prayed. <laughs> uh, and um, I always want to say, okay, let's talk about your prayer life first of all. Let's talk about what you consider asking God. Like, give me a definition here. Give me, give me a measurable amount of time. How much time do you pray every day? Minutes or hours? I'll take either one. Right? I want, I want to hear a number. Well, I don't, I just think we should. So we have to be careful here when we say, well, I asked God and he didn't give it to me. God already made it available. God already gave it to the church. Sometimes in worship, we just got to step into it. How many of you remember about 20 years ago when they had those paintings and you had to look at it for a little bit and your eyes had to cross? 3D paintings, yeah. And then if your eyes crossed, you could see something else in there. There was a, a picture in the picture. Some of you are looking at me like, you're nuts. Now listen, it was there. It was always there. But not everybody, some people got really mad and aggravated and said, it's, I don't see anything and I don't know how to. And, and it, people would explain it to them, just let your eyes cross. You know what, like when your eyes cross, just do that. And they'd be all trying to get their eyes to cross. And amazingly, person after person that I watched, when they relaxed, when they quit trying, when they didn't have somebody there coaching them. Now that's a very bad, uh, carnal, worldly kind of description of what I want to tell you about the Holy Spirit and, and the baptism, the Lord's baptism in the Holy Spirit. Because if you'll just forget everything and quit trying to get it or quit trying to defend why you don't have it, and if you'll not worry about being coached or what it's supposed to sound like or feel like, if you'll quit focusing on what you were told for years back, and if you'll just in worship just go into Jesus, you'll be surprised how easy it really is. Now you can fight it because when that first starts to happen, you feel that bubbling up inside because Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And you begin to feel that. It's really easy to say, well, I can't let this happen. My, my second cousin, Louie, he'll think I'm crazy. And years ago in Pentecostal churches, the world out there had no, didn't have the kind of leverage over us it does now because in a Pentecostal church, listen, you were the exception if you weren't praying in the Spirit. And so when you came in, you didn't have to worry about anybody out there because you, you were with your tribe. And you just came in, and if you hadn't experienced it, there was always time for you to pray and to seek it, and nobody was going to mess with you or uh, beat you over the head. And that, that's the way we need to be. Just come into it, even on a Sunday morning in worship. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, your personal prayer language and how vocal that can be, because he brings some points out in the book that um, even kind of convicted me. Okay, question? You know who I wanted to pray for too earlier when we prayed? Our young guy, Sunday morning, the 11 o'clock service, we had a young guy come and give his life to the Lord. His name was Garrett. So I'll put him on your prayer list. So. Right? 
The Spirit is given. He has been poured out. Now, when we say you, what we have to do is accept it, again, you have to step beyond your flesh, like anything in the world of God. You have to step past out of it, let it be crucified or surrendered. You can't be worried about what you're feeling. You can't be worried about what you're thinking. You can't be trying to filter it through your mind. It doesn't work that way. When that begins to bubble up inside, when you're worshiping and tears start, and I'm telling you, for me and Sister Pam and most of, many of you, it doesn't take um, the, even the tears. We, we can step into it pretty quick. But early on, you're going to be brought to that point where you're literally feeling it. And all you have to do is just step into it audibly. But that means that whatever syllable is there, you go with it. You give it vocal expression. It's in your spirit, and it's bubbling up. Well, I won't know what to say next. <laughs> Jesus said, take no thought. In that hour, take no thought what you'll say, because the Holy Spirit speaks. No, he's talking about the end times. He's talking about any time. Any time. Just trust. You, listen, if you're ever going to say anything for God, you've got to start with the first word. How many of you have been listening to the Magruder since we've been mentioning the last two weeks? Anybody been listening? Anybody dig him up, Sister Claudette? Yeah. Uh, how about Priscilla? She was something, wasn't she? And they have that song. Both of them have sung it at different times, and you can find it on there. But he, he, uh, Carol wrote it, and it says, I, I've looked at big mountains, and I wondered, I don't remember the exact words, how they climb it, and I learned that they climb it one step at a time. And, and it's that way with God. If you're going to step into something miraculous, and this is miraculous, you're going to speak a language you've never been taught and never learned. That's a miracle. Amen? And if you'll, if you'll step into that first syllable or sound or word, whatever, however you want to describe it, well, it doesn't sound like a word that I No, because you don't know the word. But I've been around a lot of languages, and some of them sound nuts. I mean, really. I remember early in Pentecost, and I would hear people praying in the Spirit, and I'd think, oh, that's weird. But now I've heard some languages that people spent years learning. I think, gosh, I've never heard anything in tongues. It's that crazy. You go to some of these places, missionary Aaron will tell you. You go to some of these places and you think, what is that? They're like clucking like chickens and, you know, just all kinds of crazy, to us, crazy sounds. Paul says here in 14, 1 Corinthians 14, there are all kinds of languages. And if you know them, they're good. But if you don't know it, it's crazy, right? So when you step into this and you're worshiping and that starts, you just got to go with it. You don't have to. You're not the one that's to assess it or to measure it. You're not the one that's supposed to judge it. This is your personal prayer life. Jesus said about prayer in Matthew 6.6, 6, when you um, go to prayer, go in, close the door behind you and pray in secret. So this is why we call it a private experience with the Holy Spirit, a private prayer language. Now, here's the issue. We come into church, and some of us, if, if you're in my zone up here, unfortunately we're pretty roped off now, but if you're in my zone on Sunday mornings, you'll, if you get too close, you'll hear me praying in the Spirit. And he says here, he, he doesn't agree with that. He thinks that's forbidden in the Scriptures, that nobody should be able to hear you because it takes away from the focus on Jesus. And uh, you have to read the book to understand how, where he's coming from, and, and I get it, and he's scripturally correct. So here's what I'm going to tell you. We're going to remain, after the pandemic, we're going to keep a seven-foot boundary around each of us, okay, so that we can pray in the Spirit, and you, you, can't, you can't get on me about it. We're going to stay, this church, of all the churches in the world, this church is going to remain, we're going to continue, we're going to love each other and hug each other. But during worship, we're going to be pandemic-spaced. His point is based here on chapter 14, that if the unbelievers hear you, and he, is, he says even believers, it, can, it just takes away from what Jesus is doing. Well, um, I, I purposed as I was reading through this, I started in this book two or three weeks ago and then came back to it this week and thought, well, I'm going to have to really uh, get my life in order here. Okay, bottom of the page on uh, page one. 
Because of the private nature of this way of praying, because most of our prayer life is be private, we have few guidelines or restrictions in the Word. I'm talking about your private prayer life and your private prayer language. The Bible really puts no restriction on you. If you drink alcohol, you can only drink so much, right? You can't drive with just like one drink or something. I saw a headline the other day where they, somebody scored the highest they've ever scored, a driver. Not, nobody had ever, whatever the blood alcohol content was, it was higher than anybody had ever. And I thought, that seems preposterous, doesn't it? Like, anyways, there's no limit. No limit with Jesus in your prayer language. Right? Now listen, if you're uh, at Rocky Gap when I'm out there, you might, um, you might steer clear more than seven feet from me. Because I, I live this way. There's no limit. I'm, I'm not bound or limited. Uh, I'll switch. I know I'm switching languages back and forth and around and around. It doesn't, I just love it. It'll change from, from every ten minutes. It'll change sometimes day by day or week by week. And uh, I'm, I don't measure it. I'm, I don't care. Well, pastor, I just don't think. I don't care what you think about my private prayer life. And you shouldn't care what I think about yours. Amen? Enjoy it. Praise God. I don't drink alcohol. This is my thing. So get out of my way. <laughs> Amen? Pam, Sister Pam and I get to sing in these Magruder songs, and, and uh, it's hard to tell what kind of fit we'll have. Have you ever heard anybody sing like that woman sang song after song and how she could talk after, like, we know what it is to push your voice. Now, I don't know how she pushed it like she did, but anyways. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. He, he has a, a list in his one chapter, chapter two or three, and he says, I wish that the Holy Spirit would have told us about all these things. He said there are many things that chapter 14 does not address about the, the Holy Spirit in service and singing in the Spirit. Sister Jane asked about singing. That's one of them that he says Paul mentions it, but he doesn't really talk about it corporately. And he says that very thing. He has been in churches where they began to sing in the Spirit. And once again, no, he's not a big fan of that. Um, I, you know, I'm sorry. Uh, and I can't stand here and say that scripturally he's, I mean, I have to say scripturally he's, he's got backup. But experientially... <laughs> I mean, I, there's some things I like, you know. And he mentions preachers are the worst. He comes right at us in there. He says, I'll be in a church somewhere as a guest speaker, and the, I know the Holy Spirit's moving, but the pastor jumps up and with a microphone is praying in his own prayer language. And you know that's what's happening. For those of us who are comfortable in Pentecostal churches, you know what I'm talking about, right? It's just that just um, you know there's not an expectation that there will be an interpretation. You know it's just not even coming. Excuse me, coming across that way. Um, it, yeah. That's right. And they all prayed in the Spirit, and really, that's. And so you had the church praying in the Spirit, all of them at the same time. Yeah, or singing, right, right. Yeah. Then. Well, and you had the unbelievers there as well, and he mentions again and again how we're not supposed to build a wall for the unbeliever to get to Jesus. So I think we're not going to talk about all of this tonight, but over the next couple of weeks, we, want to, we do want to talk about what, what is happening corporately, what are our expectations, and what are, what are our limitations. I want to tell you again, in your private prayer life, in your private prayer language, there is almost no limitation. Yes, ma'am. Sister Dunnita. Thank you. Great point, Dunnita. So I think the same for me. You know, when I, 
when I came to a spirit-filled church, I went once to a revival, and then it was a year later that I attended a, a Pentecostal church on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Saturday night, I had an experience with the Holy Spirit. But for the most part, I knew nothing. And so hearing people, it didn't encourage me to copy them. I already had my prayer language. I already had an experience. But what it did is it gave me confidence that I was doing the right thing. Does that make sense? Okay. So we're going to talk over the next couple of weeks about how we decide what's enough, what's not enough, what might be too much. And even if it hurts me, you know, if, I've, if I'm the one that's in error. Brother Bob? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Laughing in the spirit. Now, remember 25 years ago, give or take, there was Rodney Howard Brown. Uh, I'm using his name because he was associated with it. I don't know if it was ever called a specific kind of revival, but down in Florida and in his meetings, he was itinerant, but there was that. It was actually called like a laughing revival. Um, and some people have criticized that, and some people I've heard who were in those, some of those services were overwhelmed and, and blessed. It was at Toronto as well, at what they called the Airport Vineyard Church there, I think it was. Um, these kinds of things, this is me, we're going to look at the scriptures later, but these are the kinds of things that are the unique parts of the Holy Spirit. In other words, the creative and where we get in trouble, I believe, is when we try to duplicate it because we want so desperately what they have, whoever they is. Right? Now, Paul talks about, I'll get you in just a second, Sister Lynn. Paul talks about in Romans how there are things the Gentiles experience in the Lord that are supposed to make the Jews jealous. Right? So there, there's an aspect of that that... that you know, you see others just being blessed and, and you want that, but we have to be careful because just wanting even the things of God can get us in trouble because we have to want the God of the things more than the things of the God. Sister Linda, go ahead. I got 20 books coming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And as I was reading through this book and feeling personally the target a couple of times, and you know that doesn't happen as often as it might to you because <laughs> I'm usually up here. It was, <laughs> I was thinking, whoa, wait a minute. Don't hurt me here. I like what I do. But we'll talk about that. On the day of Pentecost, all of the people who heard, heard the languages that they spoke. So it almost became both prayer line, personal private prayer language, but also public ministry, gifts of tongues. And that's where it gets really difficult to uh, distinguish that because rarely are we around people that don't speak our language. And some denominations even believe that the miracle here was the evangelism, that the church began its great evangelistic efforts because of that. And so sometimes when missionaries are working cross-culturally, they should expect this kind of miracle. Now, they're never taught, 
how to do that or how to pray for it or anything. And I'm talking about outside of Pentecostal organizations, but that's the explanation they give so that they don't have to dig in. But we're going to tackle it. We're going to dig in over the next couple of weeks and say, okay, what's God, what's his intent with this? Here's what we do know. I want to emphasize this again. Your personal prayer language and experience in the Holy Spirit is almost without limits. It's encourage God again and again. God wants you to come into it. He, he loves giving it. It's his gift. It's his promise. It's for you Gentiles, not just the Jews. And he's thrilled to have you praying that way. And he'll tell you here in 1 Corinthians 14 that it builds you up, it strengthens you, and he'll tell you all the great things it does for you when you're praying that way. It helps you when you don't know what to pray for. It helps you when you're so broken and hurting that you cannot pray in English or your native tongue. There are a thousand and one things it does. But when we begin to talk about the public manifestation, the public use of that, then we get a little bit more narrow in the scope of permissiveness, what God allows. And we'll talk about why he wants that and who's to govern that. All right, but good, good point, Sister Linda. I, I listen, you're preaching to the choir because I certainly... I enjoy, um, when I feel the Holy Spirit's really moving, I think part of worship for a Spirit-filled church is, like I'm not screaming in tongues, but if you get close enough to me, you're going to know I'm praying in tongues. You're going to know I'm worshiping in tongues. Because like Donita, I, I, it, when I hear somebody start, I mean it almost instantly pulls me right in. No, right? Right. And it gets to coming up out of the overflow of that worship. That's right. I, I think that's different than what you seen in other words. Yes. That, you mentioned that earlier, Sister Pam. Let me go back to that. This, this is one of our demi- dividing lines. Who's getting the attention? Who's getting the attention? If you're close to me, you should be able to see that Jesus has my undivided attention. But if you're close to me and I'm getting the attention, then I have a problem and Jesus has a problem. And that problem's me. One of the things that the Holy Spirit points out is that the flesh and the enemy want credit. The flesh and the enemy want credit. So those are two different categories. Sometimes we have an error or something that isn't as purely an expression, uh, a prophecy as it could be because there's just a little bit of the flesh. Occasionally, and I'm talking about in the church globally, occasionally there is an attempt by the enemy to actually produce a false tongue. More often than not, the issue that we have in the Spirit-filled church is, well, I don't know, but I think, I think there was some human in that. I think there was some flesh. All right? And that's, that can be an issue, and that's where we have to learn, and we have to sharpen each other, like iron sharpens iron. But part of my job, or whoever's leading the service, is that if it appears, if it has the markings of being deceptive, that we stop it. It has to be confronted. All right, and that's one of the great challenges. Uh, we'll kind of wind down here and give you time for your question, uh, further questions and comments. They've just been outstanding. Okay, so almost all of our restrictions, therefore, focus on the public expressions. I'm on the top of page two of the Spirit within the public worship services of the church. These gifts or abilities, as the New Living calls them, are administered by the Holy Spirit and are for the sole purpose of strengthening the whole church. Notice I'm quoting those and must strengthen all of you. And I'm quoting the verses. I'm not quoting his book, quoting the Bible. Okay, this is why we say these vocal gifts must, King James Word, edify. Paul emphasizes that, the Holy Spirit emphasizes over and over, the vocal gifts as well as all the other gifts. The the public gifts, when there's a healing, it should lift up the church. Right? When when there is a a move of faith, we often see this in something financial. I'm going to show you Sunday some of the some of what happened through that thing we did back in the uh, late fall, winter, early winter when we uh, gave towards that RIP medical debt and how all the medical debt 
that was delinquent in the state of Maryland was wiped out. We just got the paperwork on that this week. So those are the kinds of things we say, oh, hallelujah, because it edified the whole church. And that these should do that as well. All right? So that's your key word there, edified. These vocal gifts must also be understood. This means that if there's a public expression of the Spirit, in life, they must be understood. Uh, we, if there's an expression we don't understand, the corresponding gift of interpretation must operate as well. While this is certainly to be received, it can be cumbersome, and the gift of prophecy is somewhat more desirable. Look at that verse 5. I wish you could all speak in tongues. Now listen, a lot of people outside of Pentecostal churches use that to say, see, not everybody speaks in tongues. There is no way on God's green earth that any apostle or anybody in that early church would say, well, it's for some but not for all. It is, it's reprehensible to say that in the face of the living God when the early church almost ripped their eyes out and cut their arms off when they heard that the Gentiles were all speaking in tongues. You can't tell me that any apostle, especially Paul, would say, well, I'm sorry a lot of you don't have this, but a few of us do. So what's he talking about? Obviously, if you look at the whole context as we did in the book of Acts, and what he went through, what he's talking about is the public. Boy, that makes sense, doesn't it? It even just feels right. Oh, he's not talking about private prayer language. God has, that's the promise for everybody. That's all, your sons and your daughters, whosoever will. It's for everybody. But not all of you are going to speak publicly. Some of you are going to be used in faith. Some of you are going to be used in discerning of spirits and Pam and Casey say all the time, and, and you have to be with me on a trip to, to see it. I, it's, it's often startling to me, too. Uh, Pastor Asher's just really hitting me right now about healing in this crusade. We, we have to see healings, and, and there are going to be lot, thousands of Muslims here, and they want to see healing. That's okay. You know, I'm focused on that, and I've, I felt God doing, but my, my anointing is for deliverance. I can't, I don't. I don't operate in here. It just doesn't happen through me that often. It just doesn't. Probably happens through you more than me. So what do I say? Do I say to God, boy, you made a mistake. No. Okay, I'm sorry. We are not, forbid, we are not to forbid this public expression of the Spirit in unknown languages. That's 1439. Of course, the Spirit cannot be indicating that some believers were forbidding the private expression of a prayer language. Because to do so would be to deny the person who was a believer in the first place. Ephesians 1.13, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. Do you know the letters, Paul's letters, were written before the Gospels? They didn't, all they had was Peter walking around and, and telling everybody what had happened to John. But they weren't recorded until Paul's day and even past that. And so what they do have are these letters coming from the Apostle Paul. And one of the first things he says is in Ephesians chapter 1. And he says to every believer, he gave you the Holy Spirit so that you would know that you're saved. Now, can you know you're saved without praying in tongues? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you can be praying in tongues and still question sometimes whether you're saved. It's been my experience, I question a lot less than I used to before tongues. You give me a half an hour or 40 minutes and, um, in prayer, and, and you, will, you could stand $10 billion in front of me, you could give me everything in the world, and you would not be able to convince me that I was an unbeliever. And you wouldn't be able to get me to give up what I had for whatever's right there. You gotta give me 30 or 40 minutes, maybe an hour in prayer. All right. I thought it was helpful. That you would understand this doesn't just happen. You have to walk in this, okay? An additional imperative is found in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 to 20, giving us an understanding of the importance the Lord places on these vocal gifts. Okay, so the one imperative, and that's his word. That's why I quoted it. That's his word, Pastor Warren Bullock. And his imperative is, number one, do not quench the Holy Spirit. And number two, forbid not speaking in tongues. 
and prophecy. And you can look those two up, okay? Finally, these gifts must be brought forth not in disorder. We're not talking about your private prayer language. We're not talking about your private experience, but publicly. These gifts must be brought forth not in disorder, but properly and in order. What does this mean? And it can mean a lot of things, but here's what I know a few of them are. It must be in the flow, that's my word, of the public worship service it's being expressed in. That's what Paul's talking about in all of 14. Actually, the whole book of 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. He's talking about the flow of the church service. He's talking about the flow of the Holy Spirit. He's talking about things happening that aren't like a train wreck. You don't get jarred and say, wow, we were worshiping. What was that? You know, that, that doesn't happen. That's not the Holy Spirit. And so there should be that flow. It cannot interrupt the flow. Number two, the leader of the service has the final say. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. I don't mean just me, but I mean whoever's leading it. You'll never see me. If somebody's up here, they're giving an altar call, you'll never see me step in front of them and take, that, take the microphone or take the service unless they are out of bounds because I will not step in to- on top of, in between, what the Holy Spirit's doing. He's using that person. That leader has that assignment. I never like it when they say, okay, we're done, pastor, take it. Now, listen, I'm fine with that when it happens, but I I think the Holy Spirit's using that person, and I want them to, to pray for people or do whatever. Okay, number three, it's open to the evaluation of other mature, spirit filled believers present. Ooh. Okay, question. We just got started tonight. I know, well, we're kind of continuing, but we're just digging in now to the, to the nitty-gritty of this. Brother Bob? You, I'm sorry? Book of Mark? Yep. Mark 16. And you're referring to those, is it 15, 16, 17? Right. And many of you will recognize that. Then he told them, go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will accompany those who believe. They will cast out demons in my name, and they will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety, and if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. They will be able to place their hands on the sick, and they will be healed. (laughs) You set me up, didn't you? (laughs) Did you get it? Do you see what he did there? Yeah, what's that last phrase say? If they lay their hands on the sick, they will be healed. Thank you. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, it's a powerful phrase. And one of the things that he brings out in his book is we don't see more of this because we don't preach for it. Did you see the headline today, maybe it was yesterday, that the number of Americans identifying as LGBTQRZ has now skyrocketed? It was like 1.8 or 1.9%. Now it's like 5.6%. And the millennials, of course, are just identifying it a huge number. Do you know why? Because they've been hearing that preaching for 25 years. And I say that to say the reason we don't see some of what we need to see in the church, and I'm talking about America, is because we don't preach for it. And he does a great job in here talking about, listen, you want the work of the Holy Spirit, you want the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you want people to experience the Holy Spirit, preach for it. And I love that because this year I've really been feeling that. You've seen evidence of it Sundays and especially on Wednesdays because I believe we're living in a time that's only going to get darker and darker and people need an experience with the Holy Spirit to thrive. Amen? To thrive. Praise God. Sometimes now when I'm praying, like I'll, I'll catch myself and I'll realize that I have not been praying in English for a long time. And so I'll switch back just because I've thought of something that I, I want to pray about. But I don't try to manage that time. I don't try to measure it. It just doesn't really matter to me. I'm free. And uh, you'll be surprised. Some of you know what I'm talking about. God will show you things when you come to that place. I mean, God will show you stuff. Somebody else tonight.
Right. So many times we have people that they want to become congregations that want to condemn what way we do things. And if we continue to do that, we're hindering the spirit of the Lord. And I think that happens so much in our environment. Um, and I, I think I'm not a, a big, big fan to condemn very many. Right. Amen. 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 And so we have to be open and sensitive to the Lord. And I believe that there's counterfeits there. I don't sure. think it's proper to Satan has counterfeits that seem to try to destroy. But we have to be careful that we don't move. God wants us to move in the spirit so that everybody can be filled with that. There you go. All of us are to be spirit sensitive and spirit-led so that we can all benefit, right? Good stuff. Anybody else tonight? Yes, ma'am? Amen. Yeah. If, um, if, if you didn't hear some of that, uh, just to, to get somebody saved and then to encourage them. And even if you aren't preaching to them about, hey, you need the Holy Spirit, certainly don't discourage them from it. Don't put warnings out there, hey, at our church this might happen, but don't pay attention. Just, just encourage them. We, uh, I felt bad Sunday morning. I, I should have really been uh, much more emphatic with that young man and just taken time. I mean, we prayed for him for a while, but I should have probably moved more into that. And I said to the Lord afterwards, please give us more opportunities to pray with people the moment they get saved, to have an experience in the Spirit. Amen. We're out of time tonight. Come on, stand with me. We've gone a few minutes late, and um, our ranger and girls' ministries leaders always look at me with a very stinky side eye when I get you out of here late. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here tonight on a Wednesday, a wonderful Wednesday, amen, in the middle of February. The daylight now is about 6 o'clock. There's just a tiny little bit of gray, light, gray sky. I thank the Lord for it because it means uh, better weather is on the way, amen. May God bless you in your personal prayer experience to be free. Man, you don't have a limit. You don't have to worry about your blood spirit content. You don't have to worry about driving under the influence. Be free. Go in 20 minutes and stay another 20. Drink all of it you want and let it be overflowing. And in your private experience, may you see Jesus. And as you walk with him, may you present yourself as a candidate for any of the public gifts of the Holy Spirit. May you present yourself. You can't make him use you a certain way, but may you present yourself as a candidate for his work through you. And may God be glorified in all of it through his son, Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless you in body, mind, and spirit. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. Love you, gang. See you on the weekend, okay? Sunday morning. Sunday night's the business meeting.